of this book. It's called The Way Things Were. And, and a lot of what this book deals with is our idea of India and how that's changed and how that's contested. And I thought I'd begin, Atish, by asking you, what, what was your relationship with history while you were growing up? Um, a relationship of absence, a relationship of lack. Uh, I think that one of the reasons uh, why I was drawn to, to Sanskrit, drawn to the idea of history in India, was because probably there was no country in the world where it was harder to form a sense of the past. And we grew up with history sort of beginning with the birth of your grandparents, you know, and, and that meant that, that you couldn't go back to access writers before you, you couldn't form, I mean, there's a line, there's a, there's a section in the book where Uma realizes that she can put the Battle of Hastings on a map, she can put Shakespeare on a map, she can put all kinds, but with the past of India, it was like a fog. And was there a moment for you when you realized, I mean, because you sort of live in this bubble, and you often what don't... bubble? Like a bubble of what you know. You know, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> but but was, there a, was there a moment when you realized this absence that you're talking about, when you felt it palpably that you wanted to access something in this past and it was out of reach, a writer or... You know, um, there very much getting started as a writer in India, I felt crippled by the fact that I couldn't reach into the literary past of India, that I had a handful of novels, uh, a little bit of like th a thin la layer of colonial education. And when you're getting started in a place as a writer, it's very important. I mean, when Eliot talks about a historical sense as people containing the literary past of Europe in their bones, I had nothing in my bones like that, you know? So uh, it, 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 it stunts you you end up like a little bit of a pygmy coming into the world because, and, 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 and never mind the fact that, that it leads to a, a situation where you have to always look outside your place for literary models. You, you're an always like actively trying to imitate someone else. Um, and and, and it, this kind of eats away at your confidence. It, it, you, you go into the world kind of a smaller man. You say it eats away at your confidence, but for many of us, that thin layer of colonial education that you talk about actually is worn like an armor and makes you know, people strut around with great confidence using language don't as mistake, a weapon. Don't mis mistake a kind of boastfulness and false pride with confidence. It's, it's, it's often, you know, you think the person, there's a line in the book where it says it's funny that when actually when when confidence fails, slogans become louder, people become more boastful. They have to say, I'm proud to be Indian. Bharat Mataki Jai. That comes, it's almost, it's, it's a strange, and so, so, so don't, I don't know if, uh, real confidence is a much quieter thing. So, let's talk about the two, um, well, I, I don't want to say the two main characters in the book, but two ideas of India that are embodied in the book. But before that, see, you, you, you studied Sanskrit for this. Um, no, but no, not no, for that's this. That's yeah. exactly what I was going to ask you. Whether you were studying Sanskrit because you wanted to write a book in which you looked at the role language played or that came later? So, so, uh, I studied Sanskrit for a very simple reason. I, I, I just wanted to, be, I wanted to be able, I was operating in a particular geographical area and I wanted to be able to read people who had been working in the same area, people who had been writing poems before me, writing plays before me, uh, actually spending a lot of time thinking very hard about literature. And the way that colonial education was designed, the way that I came, the way I was educated in India, not only did I not know these things, but I was sort of discouraged even from learning them. And that first moment in Oxford where like, in look Oxford. at look at the irony, <laughs> look at the irony, here we look what we're sitting in front of. But that first moment of, Brahadashva Uvacha from the, uh, from the Mahabharat. And, and suddenly I had a voice, a voice from classical India, very loud and clear, full of certain sensitivities, a, a certain way of looking, uh, a, a, a direct relationship with the actual physicality of India. I, was, I couldn't believe that I'd grown up without this. So it was I, emotional. It was very emotional. That, that first, in fact, for this book, um, I think I was actively 
curbing the kind of excitement Sanskrit produced in me because I thought, let it not overrun my narrative. You know, let it not become something that it, it, was, it was a kind of, normally your story is the source of your passion. In this case, of course my story was the source of my passion, but there was also this other thing. And you write, in fact, in the book that the true genius of ancient India was language. You know, I was with, talking to Shobha Mukdal yesterday and, and I think there are probably many ways in which Indians can, uh, where, where the Indian genius can be understood, can be, can be demonstrated. I have to say that probably certain things are true is that the work that was done on language, the meditation on language that that 1,000 years of classical history amounted to was probably the most profound meditation on language in pre-modern times. It's, it's, it would not be too much to say that, that if the genius of, let's say, Russia was literature or the Spanish painting, the genius of classical India was our grammarians. They, they, nobody did what we did with language. And as a writer, it seemed like a strange thing that that was what I should have been deprived of. But that sort of also leads to the question, I mean, I don't know how many people in the audience here, you know, maybe they, you went through that one year or two years of Sanskrit and you learned about the grammar and uh, you just thought it was something to memorize and, and terribly rigid rules and you, you, you sort of struggled through it and, yeah. and left it behind as quickly as you could. So when you say that the true genius uh, well, the grammarians and what they laid down. Why did that move and awe you so? Well, it's a, it's a really beautiful story, Sandeep. And the fact that it's taught badly in India, the fact that it's taught in such a way that you're meant to like come to it with piety and reverence, but that it doesn't inspire the intellect, doesn't, that's a great failing on our part. It's a, mo it's a modern failing because the, 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 the idea of this, this language with a shared history with all the great Indo-European languages. So you have, for instance, the Irish word for Ireland, which is air, and then you have it cognate with the word aria, you have it cognate with the same word that we, we get the modern name for Iran from. So that's the field. You have this incredible sprawl of like shared history. You have this language, which is really the first incarnation of that shared history and it spends a period as a, in a liturgical form as Vedic Sanskrit and suddenly there's this moment where it, so, so as Sheldon Pollock says, enters the world and blooms into a language of, of statecraft, of literature and by the end of the classical period, within, in 200 years, Southeast Asia is dripping with Sanskritic culture. And so it's, it's, I mean, it's a story that like any young person, if they were acquainted with, it would, it, it's a very suggestive story, you know? Because what you're saying is, if I'm getting it right, is that you go into looking into the past because you're trying to find a connection with our own literary past, but in the process, it opens doors within doors and you find a, a tapestry of connection that spans much further outside the Indian subcontinent. For, for sure, it, it, it's really, it gives you, a, like it's a kind of... Uh, I mean, there's a sort of like a feeling of x-ray vision. There's a, suddenly this feeling, this ability to be able to see through language. And you know, one of, the, uh, one, of the, one of the aspects of our historical situation is that we can't see the way the world is put together. You know, the w when you end up in a colonial situation, your world is kind of taken for granted and you're not able to see the little pieces. And with Sanskrit, Suddenly there was this, firstly in India, I was able everywhere, I come from a Punjabi background and I, I didn't know for instance that Punjabi was full of whole roots of Sanskrit. So suddenly you could see things that even wouldn't even exist in Hindi and, and they were there very much. So you could see this influence on Indian language, but uh, with, with, the, with the Western languages, almost every other word, whether it was something like Hrida, related to the German Hertz, to Kerr, to Cordis, to Cardio. You saw these like little lines, um, which were part of a shared history of sound, of meaning. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was a... You belonged to a much larger, like you weren't just a little pinprick somewhere, you were part of a larger scheme. 
it, it, yeah, you were able to see the threads. Right. And, and the book is full of that kind of, that, a kind of feeling of underlying threads. So then were you happy when the whole Smriti Irani Sanskrit controversy happened? You're trying to stitch me up. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you know, let, 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 me, let, me, let, me, let me draw the line in the sense that if I could believe that Smriti Irani wanted people to learn Sanskrit to awaken their intellect, uh, to arouse intellectual curiosity, I would be a great supporter of her project. I feel that her motives are wrong, that it's jingoism, that it's nation building, that it's, it's kind of this, it's more Bharat Mata Ki Jai. And let me tell you that what will happen will affect the teaching of Sanskrit. She won't be interested in Sanskrit being taught in such a way that, that Indians will have a new, uh, a new idea of the history of, of, of language, the history of, uh, of thought. She'll just want them, she'll send in the pundits, there'll be more aversion, the pundit will be a kind of holy fool in the school, the teachers, the students will gravitate towards the English literature teacher. Everything will remain as it mm -hmm. is, you know? And, um, and that's not what anyone wants. So, in this book, let's talk about some of the characters in this book. And, uh, well, I wonder if you should read a little bit first, and then we can talk about the characters. Tell me where you want... Oh, let me, let me, let me introduce Toby to you. Toby. Yeah. Uh, because that's an, actually a nice part. Um, so this is very early on in the book, and it gives you a little bit of a sense of um, the book's concerns. One second. Toby looked a foreigner in India. It was not just the light eyes, nor the fair skin and floppy, blondish brown hair. It was that above and beyond these things, there was an innocence, a naivete in his face that gave him away as someone who could not have grown up in India, not at least in North India, where even the stray dogs had a knowing and watchful look. It was strange. There was never a man who knew more about India and yet knew India less than Toby. He was like one of those men who fall in love with the idea of a woman while all the time insulating themselves from her reality. At Oxford, a student of his, a girl from Bengal, had said, Professor Ketu, it's as if you rather wish modern India didn't exist. And laughing, he had replied, don't we all? Toby's deep knowledge of classical India made the real India remote, made it more concept than reality. For there are few places where the past continues as seamlessly into the present as India, and yet where the people are so unaware of it. All around him, Toby saw the remnants of the Sanskritic past. There in the names that were compounds, the analysis of which he could do silently in his head. There in the low-lying colonies that had dressed themselves up in grand names from the epics, to which his mind could not help but go. There in the nursery down the road that had named itself after Indra's capital, or in the chemists that had taken for themselves the names of the twins who were physicians to the gods. And there in the people's language, which even in English adopted words like only and just, to compensate for lost particles of stress and emphasis, words such as he and Eva and Khalu that had come down to them from Sanskrit. Everywhere he looked, Toby could see, under layer upon haphazard layer of borrowed and vernacular language, the glorious and systematic bedrock of Sanskrit. It held for him all the frustration and excitement of seeing beneath a thick encroachment of slum and shanty the preserved remains of a far grander city, of gridded streets, sophisticated sewage systems, of magnificent civic architecture. But thrilling as it was to find extant around him the language he had dedicated his life to, it was a private thrill. For as much as the language limped on, as much as it was still visible under the Vulgate, all awareness of it had gone. It was not apparent to those living among it, it was there in the form of ruins and nothing more. The people, moreover, had no means to assess its beauty, and this could either produce embarrassment or false pride. The knowledge of decay made Toby seem passive when it came to India. The country already to so large an extent existed for him privately in his mind and imagination that he let all of it become illusory. All shadows on the wall of a cave, all a pale emanation of some far grander and irrecoverable reality. He was like a man who having known the forum in the days of Trajan returns to see it as spolia on people's houses. One, a little bit more, one second. That attitude, his aloofness, made him for all the wrong reasons attractive to people of a certain class in India. 
they confused his distance, which came from an uncompromising love for what had been lost with their own deracination. For them, he seemed to answer a need to both be in India and to stand at a distance from it. The members of this class, who were already set apart from the rest of the country by the loss of language, by privilege, of course, and by what had come to seem almost like racial differences, had no, had no desire to shed their distinctiveness. They clung to it, in fact, wanting nothing so much as to remain inviolable and distinct, foreigners in their own country. And yet, strange as it must seem, they had a corresponding desire to make a great show of their Indianness, to talk of classical dance recitals, of concerts, of textiles and spirituality, to throw in the odd precious word or phrase of Hindustani, to upstage their social rivals with a little bit of exotica so obscure that no one could be expected to know it. India was their supreme affectation. They wore it to dinner, as it were, and of course the ways in which they were truly Indian, their blindness to dirt and poverty, their easy acceptance of cruelty, they concealed very well. They spoke rapturously of India, but dreamed of the West, of European cities, of shops and duty-free.